My name's Terry McAllister. I'm a former energy editor at The Guardian and now I'm a freelance journalist. I can write about pretty much any issue that I deem important and there's a lot of them. Growing inequality, um, the Grenfell Tower, surge in the Labour Party. But one thing that really interests me is climate change. It strikes me as that's the critical issue facing myself, my family and you. And I wonder why it's not got the profile that other important issues have. I asked Kevin Anderson, who's a professor of energy and climate change, if the country is getting the sense of urgency that it needs, and secondly, if not, why not? Overall, I would say no. Um, you know, because the public, of course, are getting messages all the time from, from the scientific community, from the NGO community, from the policy and business community, and I think the, the scientific message is not sufficiently robust within that, so we're not making our case as strongly as I think we should make. We are adjusting and say fine-tuning that. Um, now it does depend a little bit on where you go to look at these issues. I think in terms of impacts, in terms of what we see happening around the world from, this, from the level of warming we've seen so far, I think that's probably, as I understand it, it, it is well portrayed and I think it is, it is you know, as neutral as these things can reasonably be and there's a lot of uncertainty and difficulty in doing that. But it's when you come to the what do we need to do about climate change challenges, when you come to the agenda that is innately political or has innately political repercussions, put it that way. It's not, it's not innately political, but the repercussions definitely are. Um, and it's then that I think the public is being sold the pop. When I talk to colleagues about, or journalists about Kevin Anderson, they say, oh, you know, he's, yeah, we know Kevin Anderson, he's gone a bit of a sort of hard line, um, slightly separate from mainstream, sort of, or considerably separate from mainstream academic or or climate change community views. Is, is that fair? Are you an outrider? No, I don't. Well, it depends what an outrider from what. Um, academic? No, I think I stick very closely to the academic line. I'm um, an outrider from the broad science. No, I stick very closely to the IPCC science, particularly working group one. I'm less interested when the economists get involved. Um, so no, I think I stick to the academic line. I stick to basically the science, and I stick to basic maths, and I make my assumptions uh, clear and transparent. Now, if people call that an outrider because it doesn't give you a politically expedient response or set of conclusions, then, yeah, they can just be to be an outrider. But I think I'm mainstream, down the line, academic, in line with the science. So you haven't, you, you've been also fairly critical of um, the academic community. You, you sound frustrated by them. Is that right? Um, by some within the academic community, but I would say I'm frustrated because they're not academics within the academic community. What they do is they apply their own non-academic sets of judgment and then tailor their academic analysis to fit with what's politically expedient. And I do not think that is our job. Um, you know, there's a role for academics in society, and I left the oil industry to come into academia to fulfil that role, and that role is to be... Um, is to disregard political sensibilities. I think they have nothing to do with us. We do our analysis and we should, we should do it carefully and um, robustly and we have to have some humility that we will from time to time get it wrong and then we adjust it accordingly. And then we should, we should communicate it clearly and bluntly without any spin. Um, and for many years now I have known quite a lot of academics who have deliberately spun their line and they've said to that to me repeatedly offline. These are very senior academics who are repeatedly quoted in the media who are in some of the most well-established institutions in this country. Um, and they will say things um, off, off the record that they do not say in public. And sometimes that's just a matter of tone but and sometimes it's something much more than that. And I come across this all the time. I came across it with one of the most senior climate scientists um, I won't say who it was, just the other day, who gave a completely different view to, to, the, um, to the camera, as he had done to me over a pint. I won't say where it was, otherwise I might give a clue as to where it was. So is, is, this, um, is, is this view that's being espoused publicly being done because that, those kind of academics feel that's what they've got to say, or that's where they're funding comes from, or that's what the government want them to say, are they actually pursuing that um, themselves in their work, or are actually they've got a, they, they're doing something privately but saying something else? I think it's a mixture of all of those things, to be honest. First, I think it's quite hard, if you look at the science, you look at the numbers, 
and you're realistic about what we can do with technologies. Um, I don't just mean inventions, I mean actually penetrating the actual system with technologies. Then I think you are, you are left in a very uncomfortable position. And I think it is difficult to hold that position. It's difficult to do work that day in, day out tells you it looks like we're, we're heading to hell in a handcart. And so there's lots of, there are lots of psychological reasons, coping mechanisms that we use. But aligned with that, we have the research councils who want to ensure that the funding that they give, um, any research, can help feed into the, uh, to the agenda of economic growth. If you just look at the strategy documents for the research councils, it emphasises that repeatedly, regardless of which research council you go to. So across the board, what you see is, uh, is this sort of agenda, which is one that is driven by political expediency, by the current paradigm, which you must not question. And I think there used to be really an arm's length distance between universities and academics, and if you like, politics. And I think now it's, it's a little more than a cigarette paper. That's probably not the correct term to use nowadays, but whatever a thin piece of paper would be, between the academics and, um, and the funders and the government. We have become far, far too close. Indeed, I think also often with industry as well. That's not to say we shouldn't engage with them. Of course, we should do. But then to, to, to actually adjust our, to fine tune our assumptions to deliver expedient responses is, in my view, inappropriate and in something like climate change is almost immoral. Are the, um, the scientists, whether for personal reasons, psychological reasons, because they can't cope with the enormity of, of endless um, apocalyptic visions, or because they're, they're consciously or subconsciously under pressure from um, government um, funding organisations or anything else, pursuing a kind of softer lie. There's a lot in that, so you have to unpick it. Firstly, I mean, there's not, a, there's not just one sort of climate scientist. There are, there, are, there are a big mishmash of people with different personalities and different sets of reasons. And I would say that actually a lot of time, the actual science itself, the, particularly the pure basic sort of physics type science, is, is done in the appropriate way that academics should be pursuing science. It's the agenda around that, um, when you can adjust your assumptions to make sure that your conclusions using appropriate, robust science um, are more in line with what people want to hear. So in a sense what you're doing is you're doing ob objective analysis but within subjective boundaries and we actually adjust the boundaries, because they are subjective, to give us these nice answers, or nicer answers. Um, and I also think that at any one time that we, we're not a set personality all the time, so depending on what audience you're with and depending on how you're feeling on that particular day, um, to know the sorts of questions and the engagement you're having with, with the people you're speaking with, I think you may, may well also respond slightly differently, um, which, which is understandable. Um, so if you're talking to policymakers, sometimes you probably don't want to paint a, a you know, really apocalyptic future with, you know, with the sort of things I would question like economic growth. Regardless of whether economic growth is traditionally seen to be good or bad, I would just simply say you cannot reconcile that with the mitigation rates that are necessary to deliver the carbon budgets that are provided by the IPCC when you take any account of equity between the poor and the wealthy parts of the world. I think there's no way out of that. Um, but they, they're not prepared to say that sort of thing. But I think that is changing, and I've had other people tell me this now as well, that, that because the agenda has changed, because we haven't succeeded, it's harder and harder to hold a soft line. And you already see the scientific community changing a little bit, but it, there's always these new techniques that allow us to again pedal a softer line. So whether that's now with the negative emission technologies, or when they know that fail, it'll be the solar radiation management. There's always something else that we can rely on to allow us to pedal this soft, slightly softer line. Well, not slightly, much softer line. You've explained the pressures on the scientists maybe to soften their line. We know why the policy makers who deal in four-year electoral cycles might soften the line, but why are the NGOs softening the line? They've been co-opted, by and large. I mean, I know some of the NGOs quite well, some of the people in some of the NGOs, and some of the people I have a lot of time and respect for are really diligent, careful in their analysis and in the conclusions that they draw from that. But I think a lot of the NGO, other NGOs have effectively been co-opted and again want to, want to paint a rosier picture than the one that we actually have. So I think the NGOs are, are part of this. And I also would say, I mean, there are... Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth? Yep, across the board. I, I mean, personally, I've had a lot of engagement with Friends of the Earth, and I found them... I mean, I think it's much more to do with the personalities, perhaps more so than the organisation, but Friends of the Earth in the UK, I found them the most robust 
of all of the NGOs that I've engaged with. Nevertheless, I still think they've overplayed some of the people that I know they're getting, I think overplayed the hand in terms of the renewable energy technologies. We need to move away from fossil fuels. We can do it in line with the carbon budgets for just about 2 degrees centigrade. I want to see the energy consumption of the poor parts of the world rise, indeed including some of the people in our own country. And what we are talking about is really the foxes having to put in reinforcement on the chicken 